Welcome back to the Heartland Pod. My name is Adam Summer, and I am your host. This is a Tuesday edition of the podcast. I'm going to make sure that I've got my dates right this time because I definitely missed a date last week, and uh, that's on me because I just wasn't looking at a calendar. Uh, Tuesday, June 7th edition of the podcast. This is a Let's Have a Chat version of the show, so I have a conversation coming up for you. This one is with Gene Evans. Uh, Gene Evans is uh, now working for a nonprofit uh, company, um, and you can look that you'll you'll hear all about it during the show, and you can look them up and find whatever you want to find about them. Uh, she works. Uh, she would call it school choice. I'll call it defunding public schools. Uh, I think you'll find in the conversation we agree to disagree about quite a bit of stuff, and you can sort of be the judge of what you think makes sense and doesn't make sense in, in as far as what both of us are saying. Um, but more importantly to me was, you know, we, we had a real conversation, I think. Um, and, it, you know, I, I try to make these not be just interviews of, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And then let somebody talk. I try to make it an engaging conversation. And so I hope that's what this was. And I hope that, you know, it makes you think about the subject. Maybe it helps you flesh the subject out more. Maybe it changes your mind one way or the other. Maybe it solidifies you in your opinion. I don't know, but I hope it helps you think about it. And and most importantly of all, and this was the one thing that Gene and I definitely agreed on. There are a few things we agreed on, but this was the one thing we definitely agreed on is I hope it helps you just see folks or hear folks have a conversation that disagree with one another. And realize that that's okay it's okay to have that conversation and then it doesn't have to be a fight you know at no point during this and in fact we we talked much longer because we talked before we ever hit record uh for quite a while we were just sort of chit-chatting and getting to know each other a little bit and we talked for a very long time and at no point during our conversation well over an hour of conversation at no point did we have the kind of conflict or, you know, vitriol in our voice from one another, or, you know, type of, you know, just sort of bile build up, you know, gross behavior. It just wasn't there, right? We disagreed. We directly disagreed with one another, in fact. But we didn't come at each other with straight up anger. And it's it's a great example, I think, of that kind of conversation. It's also a really good example, I think, of why arguing with somebody on whether it's Twitter or Facebook, any social media, you're always going to lose that nuance. And what you might see as a very harsh attack, it might not be if you could hear the tone of the person saying it, right? They might even be saying it in a way that's almost noncommittal, but you don't know that. You don't know that because you're not hearing their tone. You're just reading their words, right? This conversation stemmed from, I tweeted something a while back. I don't even remember what it was. I didn't even look up the tweet, but something about basically if we move funding from public education to private, that it's going to be a mistake that we're going to regret that mistake. And a lot of folks agreed with that and it, you know, got retweeted and shared and liked and all that stuff. And it was, you know, going crazy or whatever. Uh, I won't call it viral. Um, it's not like it wound up, you know, I didn't go Ian Mackey, right. With this thing. Um, but it, it took off and uh, I went to Lowe's. It was a Sunday morning early. I went to Lowe's. I was buying some hoses uh, and some other things. I'm upgrading my hoses this year, uh, which is a luxury that I had no idea I needed, but my God, uh, was I using some bad hoses. But anyway, so I go to Lowe's, I get some hoses and I come out and I, you know, go home, whatever. And I pick up my phone and I see on Twitter that I've, I've got the, all these notifications of Gene Evans. And I'm like, what you know? Why is that? I didn't say anything to her. Well, she had quote tweeted me four times about what I had said, and one of them was about how I should do some research. Now, those of you who listen to this show a lot know that that's basically what I do anyway, and that I probably already had done my research when I said what I said, and I had, uh, but I did some more just to see you know maybe I'm missing something. Made sure I understood her organization and all that, where its funding comes from who's behind it all. I did my research and we had this conversation. So that was a really long intro, uh, but I appreciate Gene's time and I hope you enjoy it. 
so just a reminder, check us out, heartlandpod.com, Twitter, at the Heartland Pod, all that good stuff. Uh, here is my chat with Gene Evans, uh, and I'll just say it's on school funding, and we'll leave it at that. Let's have a chat. All right, we're here for a chat. I have got Gene Evans with Federation for Children. Uh, Jean spent a term as a state representative. She ran the Missouri Republican Party and now works for that nonprofit. Uh, and this is right off the website. It says the average public school student receives more than $15,000 per year. Lower and middle income families with kids in private schools deserve a portion of the funds allocated to their child's K through 12 education for immediate tuition relief. So that's kind of where we're headed with this chat uh, just so folks know so gene thank you very much for taking the time uh, and thanks for we had a, a lengthy conversation before we hit record and i appreciate it. i know the blues game's on and that's a big deal out your way so thanks yes. for your time yeah thanks for having me absolutely and I, and I really appreciate we were talking about some you know before we hit the record button um having these kinds of conversations i know there's some folks who will listen to this and they'll be frustrated with the way this conversation goes because they want me to yell at you or ask insane questions. Um, and uh, I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate you being willing to come on a show that, uh, you know, is a progressive show. And we, you know, we may not see eye to eye on, on stuff. And I, I like being able to have those conversations. Yeah, I do too. And I'm actually really interested um, to hear from somebody who's not an elected official right. um, about your objections to school choice sure. and why, you know, what we, particularly from how the movement started to how we got here, because it's definitely a movement that started with Democrats in urban areas looking for answers for kids in urban areas to have better educational options. And and is still very much fueled and funded by progressive donors. But in St. Louis and in Missouri, it has not caught on with Democrats. So uh, a question there then, uh, um, Milton Friedman. I mean, when I, when I look for everything in the background of school choice, um, the name that pops up as sort of the father of school choice is Milton Friedman from 1955 which of course is the year after Brown versus Board of Education was handed down in 1954. Um, and there's a, a pretty fascinating book, uh, Democracy in Chains uh, by Nancy McLean out of Duke uh, that sort of traces that uh, and, and traces it through the Virginia School of Economics uh, and, and, a, and a heavy push for uh, school choice in the late 50s into the 60s and 70s uh, that, that really we're seeing the fruits of today. But you're saying, I mean, where do you pinpoint that start as a progressive movement in the cities? Because that, I mean, that's just not what I find. So, well, we had a celebration in September up in uh, Milwaukee where uh, kind of this started and where American Federation for Children actually gained a lot of ground in Milwaukee or kind of grew out of that movement. Dr. Howard Fuller, and then another woman who was like a state rep, and I, her name escapes me. Um, she's no longer with us. But she demanded better educational options for kids trapped in failing schools in Milwaukee. And Milwaukee mm -hmm. has one of the more robust school choice programs at this time. Um, St. Louis, uh, Washington, D.C. has a pretty good program. There's some stuff they do in New York that's really great. And they're in Florida as a state probably has the most school choice options, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's charter or private school choice voucher programs. They've got a they've got a, a lot but when, and I have to tell you, I don't come at this as a historian. I came at this as somebody who um, thinks that um, every kid should have the opportunity to get a great education. I think mm -hmm. education is the enemy of poverty. And one of the things we do really well as a nation is we do educate our kids, male and female, <laughs> unlike some countries. Um, and we don't uh, segregate them by race or anything like that. But one of the things we do really bad in that process is people who already have means often have means to a greater education and other kids and families who are in certain zip codes are sort of trapped in these failing schools. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't think that's right. I mean, we have generations of kids here in St. Louis who ha haven't had a chance to really learn how to read and write. Yeah. And it's generational poverty. And I think that needs to change. And I think that those kids, no matter where you live, if you're living in Warrington, Warrensburg, or the inner city of St. Louis, 
you should be able to um, take advantage of the best educational option for your particular situation. Um, and, and that would be an equalizer. The other thing I think it would do is really help it reinvigorate some of our urban areas because people are fleeing the cities and they're fleeing primarily for two reasons. One is crime and the other is um, failing schools. So they're, you know, we set up rules in a lot of our cities. They've done that in St. Louis city here, where if you're going to work for the city, you got to live in the city. I mean, we're forcing people to stay there because we can't get them to stay there any other reason. What we really want to do is make it so attractive to live there that people don't want to leave. We don't have to yeah. put up rules or walls. So are you not familiar then with the Griffin versus board of Prince Edward County, the Virginia case from the 1950s? No, I'm sorry. So, I mean, if we're talking school choice and we're, and we're talking about origins uh, in, in Prince Edward County in Virginia, they actually shut down all of the public schools, all of them. And they opened white only private schools and they used tuition vouchers for private schools for white students to attend those schools. And it took a while, but it eventually made it to the Supreme Court, which ruled that that was unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause. Yeah, well, I and, think so. Yeah. And, that, and that's really, that's, you know, the, 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 the private voucher system, the school choice uh, debate, all of that really stems out of that mid 50s. Uh, and, and a lot of it coming out of that Prince Edward uh, County. And that, that's what I'm talking about in Virginia there. So it, it's worth folks, and I'll, I'll post a link to this. Uh, there's a really good Forbes article from 2021. Uh, on this. So this is not from like some crazy, you know, I'm not going to post like a WAPO article. This is a no, Forbes but, article. Yeah, but I, I, I'm, I'm interested in that. And it's certainly, um, you know, I think you see things throughout our history where folks try to abuse the laws to somehow benefit themselves, whether yeah. it's, you know, racial or class or whatever. Um, so fortunately, that was ruled unconstitutional. And I'm not familiar with that. And I guess, you know, I might look at differently if that's how I was first introduced to it, but I'm introduced to it as somebody who, as a parent, quite honestly, when my daughter, who, I mean, I moved where I live so she could go to Parkway Schools, which is a very good school district. Mm -hmm. She was there for three years. A very good public school district. Very good public school district, supposedly. And um, she wasn't thriving. It's like, it was what I would say. I wouldn't say like she was failing but she definitely was not thriving. And, um, you know, we're at the end of fourth grade and she can't add or multiply without using her fingers. And by that time she should know how to do that. So I put her into a private school and it was really hard changing schools at that age. She had a hard time with that, but she did thrive and it was just a better fit for her. And it continued to be a good fit. And um, it was very difficult to continue to keep her in private schools as a single parent going all the way through 12th grade, but um, probably the best money I ever spent in terms of how it helped her develop both, you know, her, her mind and her socially and her, those things. And I just want every family to have that same opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I also think, you know, they talk about, you know, there's these school choice programs are just for wealthy people. Wealthy people already have school choice. They can already go to private schools or move to yeah. Clayton or Wildwood or whatever. It's the folks who don't have the means to do that, who, who are missing out on those opportunities. And it might not even be, I mean, like if you looked at test scores from where my daughter went to grade school compared to Parkway, they may be the same, or they may be less. It was just a better fit for her. Mm -hmm. And I think that parents should have a voice in that and should be able to do that. The other thing I believe is that competition makes us better. I mean, we're a country that thrives on competition. We love to watch sports. We love to watch game shows, competitions on whether they're, um, what do you call it, reality TV. We love competition. We're in a capitalist country and we, have, we don't have competition in our public school system. And I think that it suffers because of that. I think that having competition drives innovation and it drives performance. And we've seen in places where comp competition is introduced and we have good public, uh, private school vouchers that the public schools actually get better. And the reason we know that is because folks from left-leaning institutions studied this to show 
how we were draining the public schools and how we were hurting them with school choice and found the opposite. So what, what institute, I mean, who has studied this? Can you give me actual information? Yeah, I've got, that? Um, we have a lot of this on our um, website on research, but like there's, there are dozens of studies and different things related to um, likelihood of incarceration for someone who goes, who has the option of getting into a school choice program, 100% less likely, by the way, in New York for an African-American male to end up incarcerated if he yeah i saw that it was like a 4.4 percent chance and it went down to a zero percent chance okay um i've got let's see Figlio. same thing with the pregnancy thing it went from like uh something like 17.9 percent to like nine point something percent or something like that that's pretty significant sure it is it, it was also one study in one area right so and to be, I've got to a be list. perfectly clear because i want to be you know, right. we're having this conversation, but I mean, you are today, you are paid to advance policies that move money from traditional public schools to charter schools and private schools. I mean, that's a true statement, isn't it? Uh, that's how I wouldn't phrase it like that. I would phrase it. I am. Is it a false statement? I don't think of it as moving this, the money away from the schools. I feel the a way of the, uh, my money, my tax dollars, the tax dollars that you pay into the state coffers should follow our student to the school that best fits them. But by I the same logic, shouldn't I be able to say, I don't like missiles. I don't want my tax dollars used on missiles. I, I see your point there, but I think this is different. And it's just, you know, they say, well, that shouldn't have, well, what about Pell Grants? We don't tell kids who get Pell Grants, you can't go to SLU, you have to go to Merrimack Community College or you have to go to Mizzou or their Medicaid dollars. Sure. or their EBT dollars. We let them spend them in the institutions that best suit their needs. But well, for some, some people let them do that, but other people will completely oppose that. I mean, we just had an EBT debate on the Missouri floor, Missouri yeah. Senate floor about whether or not they could use EBT where they want to use them. A lot of folks don't want that to happen. I they mean, don't want to, uh, there, there are folks who don't want that to happen for them to use them in restaurants. And I, that's, I mean, that's a whole different issue that we right. could get into another time. And I don't, I don't think I but don't but, but my question was just, is that true? I mean, is it a true statement that you are paid to advance policies that move money from traditional public schools to charter schools and private schools? I, I am paid to advance policies that empower parents to choose the, the education that fits best for their student. That's right. well, how I We'll let it. folks interpret that however they okay. want to interpret that. <laughs> uh, I do want to clean up something because um, one of the things that I find in this debate that is often misunderstood is that when you know when we're talking about school choice first of all I, I agree with some folks i don't think school choice is a very good word or a very good phrase for it um because it, it's not going to create choice for everybody we'll, i want to talk about that in a minute but but mostly because uh it confuses some of the issue about what's really happening um because we've got charter schools and we've got private schools mm -hmm. and I think a lot of folks confuse that. I think they just yeah. sort of lump the two together. And I'm sure you see that when folks are, you know, whether it's somebody like me, you know, you and I, I posted a thing on Twitter, you quote tweeted it several times, then some other folks jumped in and said some stuff. And, you know, it's very clear that for some folks, private school and charter school are sort of, you know, lumped together right. and they're not the same thing. No, no, charter schools are public schools that have a different governing board. Right. And so instead of having an elected board, they have a, a pri like a, almost like a private board, like a right. nonprofit would have. And so people say, well, they're not accountable. Well, they're accountable to the parents who send their kids there. If you mm -hmm. don't like the school or how, you're, you're, how things are performing, you can pull your kid out. Whereas in traditional public schools, you're pretty much stuck with every school, you know, the government tells you to go to, you can't change schools. So your only recourse is through an elected body of our school board. But isn't that, I mean, isn't that sort of the, the point of local control? I mean, you say your only recourse. In the one hand, I've got an appointed board that I can't vote out. On the other hand, I've got elected officials that I can go, hey, your, your term is only so long, and I think you guys are doing a bad job, and now I can use basic direct democracy. But you don't have to go, to go to the, you don't have to go to the charter school. You choose to go to the charter school. So why would you choose to go there if you didn't like the governance? Sure, I, I, can, I can understand that logic. But from a from a accountability standpoint, we're talking about tax dollars, aren't we? Right. I mean, what other place do we give people tax dollars and you can't you don't have accountability where folks can vote and say, I don't want you to be in charge of these tax dollars. 
well, what, do you, well, what if we go back to Pell Grants? Right. So if I choose to use my Pell Grant to go to Mizzou, I don't have an, I don't really have a voice in who their governing board is. I choose to go there with my feet, like with my dollars, I choose to spend my Pell Grant dollars there. It's, it, it's not that different, really. I, I don't see it as that different. And I don't understand why there's this upset. I mean, most people have no idea who's even on their school boards and they talk about, well, that's real accountability. And yet we see all these <laughs> fights right now as school right. boards don't want to release information. And so, I mean, there's some argument about how accountable they truly are, but you could say well, that. And, and I will argue that most, most parents don't pay the right amount of attention to their kids' education anyway. Uh, yes. As somebody yes. who does a lot of custody work, I find <laughs> one of the hardest questions for parents to answer is who is your kid's teacher? Um, you know, who's the principal of the school, who is the, um, and and it's true. I mean, people struggle with that stuff because life is busy and it's hard. And I mean, I'm a super engaged parent and I still, you know, from time to time may not communicate as much as I want to, but like, I've never had a problem. My kids aren't that old, but like, I've never had a problem not getting information from my kid's school ever, not ever. I mean, I get a lot, I get, I get so many freaking, I get emails from my kid's school so often that I'm pretty sure they're running for Senate. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's how often I get emails. Well, the, one of the things we hear a lot about is, um, is bullying too. And, um, so there's no bullying in charter schools. In I, I didn't schools. say that, but sometimes <laughs> the best thing for a student is the opportunity to change schools. And that's not always, it's not a great idea to be changing schools all the time. I'm not advocating for that, but I, I, I was sitting next to a superintendent one time who was very much against any private schools, charter schools or whatso- whatsoever. And then he made a conversation about one of his neighbors. They pulled their kid out of school because he was being bullied and they were homeschooling. And he's like, well, that's just ridiculous. I can't believe they pulled them out of school. And I'm thinking, what must this family be going through with this kid that yeah. got so bad that they pulled them out of school? And why couldn't, and usually the, the, what you hear from parents is we've contacted the school and we got nowhere. We're not getting yeah. any answers. We're not getting any help. And it's tough in that situation. If you're a teacher or an administrator, because most of the bullying, you don't really see. And you, it's hard to know when there's conflicts between kids, what's really happening. They yeah. don't, and, and they're, our teachers, we expect them to raise our kids for us practically. I mean, there's yeah. such a burden on them. Not only do they have to teach them to read and write, but now they're supposed to teach them citizenship and values and how to be polite and all these other things that used to be taught more at home. But, and that happens in private schools too. Trust me, I mean, private school teachers will tell you parents drop their kids off and they expect the teachers to raise them. So there is a, a, a lot of that. I mean, the, any- and paired with that is the flip where more and more and more, I mean, my, my wife's in education. So, you know, the full disclosure of, you know, I, I have a financial stake here too, right? But my wife is an educator. She's been in the classroom and I know lots and lots of teachers. And I, I don't remember ever coming home and telling my parents something about what happened at school and them going with me to go and yell at the teacher, right? Oh, I remember them I yelling know. at me. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> and disciplining me and telling me to listen to the teachers. But I don't right. ever remember my parents getting cross with a teacher, certainly not in front of me no. about anything. Uh, and I feel like that happens more and more um, and for, for often for things that are out of the teacher's control or are unrealistic expectations. And, and what you're talking about, that raising of the kids, I mean, we do have the in loco parentis doctrine that's been around for a long, long time, mm-hmm. uh, that if you leave, you know, when you engage in this operation, then you do give certain powers over for that time to mm-hmm. this, you know, to this school. Um, but absolutely, a lot of folks have become reliant on that in a way that doesn't make any sense. Um, but but how does how does school choice make that better? I mean, how does it solve that problem? I mean, there's well, still so, going to be bullying. There's still going to be problems with that. There's still going to be parents who are overly reliant. Yeah, there are. And there's, there's all, you know, I mean, I think we've, we've been in, I, I coached for 25 years. So this, everybody gets a trophy. Uh, everybody is an honor student. Everybody gets an A. Everybody, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that has been cultural kind of growing and it's generational. I think we'll grow out of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think school choice solves that. But what I do think happens is when you have a robust school choice program, there's a couple of things. First of all, parents have options. So if if it's not a good fit for their kid, they can go somewhere else. 
This is especially true for kids with all different kinds of special needs, everything from being dyslexic to speech pathology to different things. I, I have a friend in southwestern Missouri, two twins about to go to kindergarten. They both need speech pathology. It's a small group of kids, but there's like five of them in this incoming class that need speech pathologists. They have one for the entire district. The district next to them is not quite as big as their district, but they have five speech pathologists just in the grade school. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I wanted my kids to go there because they're going to get better attention for their special need. But they don't, we don't have a mechanism to do that. In sure Missouri. we do. It's called the IDEA Act. It's a federal law that requires that education to be provided by public schools. And the parent can voice that concern and they can bring that up. And if they, if the public school doesn't listen, they can get a lawyer involved to deal with that. I, you want to talk about special needs. I have a five-year-old in a wheelchair with Rett syndrome, which is a genetic disorder. She can't talk. She can't walk. She can't feed herself. She can't go to the bathroom. She can't do anything without 100% assistance all the time. Mm -hmm. And now for her, and then this is part of where I think, you know, from a fixing things standpoint, I don't care what school you're going to, you know, I, I get all the time, boy, she's lucky to have you guys as parents. Well, you shouldn't have to have a lawyer and a mom with a master's degree who works in education Bingo. to get that kind of help. But that is there. It's there. And the fact that the school district is underfunding that themselves, that's a district problem that can be fixed. But it's not going to be fixed if people just run away. And now the next kid who needs speech pathology in that school is going to be in the same predicament. Now, what I would say is to that is I would like to see more collaboration. I'm not trying to destroy public schools. I think they need more freedom and more innovation. And what we're doing and what we're trying to do is give them less, right? We want to control everything. But I, I feel like centrally control it out of Jeff City. I, I am for local control. But I think that um, well, and that's something that's coming from I mean the party that you helped run. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. So it, it, there's and there's a fine line between having standards and then being overly controlling. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, that state control thing, going back to that history lesson on Milton Friedman, uh, folks should check that out because it's right in line with what those guys wanted to do. It's right on line with what those guys wanted. Surprise me. So I mean, uh, and. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I grew up in Ferguson. So we moved to Ferguson when I was in grade school and I went to integrated schools that were integrated nat naturally, mm -hmm. right? We didn't have busing. And then we moved to Kirkwood and it was like a different world. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, to me, I just had friends. I didn't have black friends or white friends. You just have your friends. And then um, then you go to some place where it's like, well, you have to call people African-American. I'm like, can I just call them a friend? Like, I don't, why do I have, to have these labels? But coming back to the school choice thing. So I, I think what happens is it, particularly on, on smaller districts, you know, where you have kids, you know, even I had um, as a state rep, I had an entire school district in one location in Valley Park. It's K through 12 mm -hmm. in the middle of St. Louis County um, in the midst of some bigger districts. And they do a really good job. Um, but it's, you know, it's pretty small like class size compared yeah. to whatever. And I was visiting there one day and I, I can't remember the exact number, but I was around 30 different languages being spoken at home. And so they had an ESL teacher who's got um, like 15 kids in the class for that one. They were like the brand new beginners. And then another 15 kids that had been here, you know, at least a year and still we're learning, but kids are pretty pick up English pretty quickly, mm -hmm. but the, um, the reading, the writing and all that, that, that goes along with it. So this is awesome that we have this multiculturalism in Valley park, which is like a little bit of Jeff County in the middle of St. Louis County, if you're not familiar with the St. Louis area, but, um, what a strain on their resources and they have found ways to to deal with that the teach esl i mean i i know the teacher who was teaching at the time was had not been a specialist in that but was interested in it and the superintendent sent her to some classes and she embraced it and they found innovative ways to teach the kids and i love that model and i saw them doing a lot of awesome things there with the resources that they had and with a really um forward-thinking superintendent who made great hires and the kids are blessed by that. And it's also like a really strong community. Like most of the school board members went to that school. Like they've been in the community their whole lives and they really care about it. 
We don't have that everywhere. And in places where we don't have that, I don't think the school board system is working well enough to make it better. I mean, I talked to somebody in, uh, again, near Joplin, they were talking about two districts right next to each other. One of them runs like a well-oiled machine and the other one is terrible. Mm -hmm. And saying, how can we fix that? I mean, I've heard, well, let's move the elections for school boards to November. Maybe that'll make a difference. Maybe that will help. I I don't know, but I truly 100% believe that competition just in general, it's like a, a natural law makes things better, drives innovation. And I can tell from the studies that where they have robust school choice, guess what? They also have higher teacher salaries because schools are competing for the best teachers. You and talk find- about these studies and you, when you and I uh, back in April, uh, when I had tweeted what I tweeted and you had done the quote tweets, you had referenced one and you put a link in and I, I followed that. I, I took a look at it um, and it wasn't a study. It was a link to some guy's blog out of New Hampshire who was talking about a study out of Florida okay. that didn't have a link to anything. It had no link to any study. I've looked at the New York one. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've pretty much read the, 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 uh, the, oh, the Federation for Children. I pretty much yeah. read everything on your website. Um, and we I mean, have, uh, there's some stuff of- out there, but there's not, I mean, I, I guess here, here's, here's what I would say about that is number one, I, I understand the, the philosophy of, of, you know, competition breeds innovation. I, I get the philosophy on that, but isn't that like saying, you know, Hey, if we just built more highways, right, we have highway 70 going down the middle of, of Missouri and it's got plenty of problems, right? Thanks to Thanks to Roy Blunt, we're getting a brand new bridge going across at Roachport. It's going to be beautiful. There's, if, by the way, folks, if you haven't driven across I-70 across Missouri and seen what they're doing, it's worth the drive just to see the cranes and the river. It's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we have this highway that is just already needs so much help. Why would we open a new highway and split our funding to build another bridge across the river when we just got the funding for this bridge? I mean, why is that going to make it better if we're splitting our funding? So I, I think that's an apples to oranges comparison, I'll be honest with you. I mean, like a, a highway- Well, it's a roads to schools comparison. They're both public goods that everybody uses. Right, but it, a one road that's well-designed serves everybody's purposes pretty well. It's not like a school that has all different kinds of kids with different needs and abilities and speaking different languages and coming from different backgrounds. I mean, it's, it's very different. Um, but but my, the reason I use I-70 is, you know, talking about a school that's not running very well. Um, my God, I avoid I-70 at all costs, right? I-70 is a freaking nightmare to drive on. If I'm going to, you know, I'm in Warrensburg, I'm on, I'm on 50. If I can use 50 instead of 70, I'm going to, and 50 is not exactly a, a picnic all the time. No. So, uh, you know, I, I, that, that's, that's why I use, use that point because it, it is one of those things that it's not, it's not in the best shape that it could be in. But why would we move that money if we could make that road better? I mean, you know, now there's the passing lanes at like Mineola Hill. That's made that a lot better. There could be more lanes on 70. It could be, it could be a better highway. Why don't we make everyone who lives in your area go to CMSU? Why do we let them go to Mizzou and make a choice about where they That's higher education. That's different altogether. How is that different? Because you, because there's no compulsory laws about higher education. There's compulsory laws about education up until age 16. Okay. So, so that, no you want to talk about apples to oranges. That's that, completely apples to oranges. You don't have to drive on roads. There's no law that says you have to drive on the highway. Yeah, but that's an insane analogy. What am I going to do? Buy a helicopter? I mean, no, but I mean, th- and I that, think- that's, that to me is school choice is saying, you know, we, we want to send money to private schools. That's like saying, don't worry, there's going to be helicopters over here. And maybe you'll get lucky enough to get that. And by the way, if it's a charter school and there's a lottery, good luck. I mean, you know, talk about these small schools. Leeton is a school that's about 15 miles from where I live. Leeton is a very small school, K through 12. Um, if, if that school loses a third of its student population to a charter school, mm-hmm. it's probably not going to make it. And it's a pretty decent little community school. If it's a pretty decent community school, why would it lose a third of its students to a charter school? Because new, no- new shiny things make people go ooh-ah. Well, I mean, why would they build a charter school where there wasn't enough population to sustain it? I mean, that doesn't make any sense either. I mean, so they don't get school choice. That that's not true. If they want to have, um, they can have school choice through private b- vouchers. And where are they going to go? So, in Missouri, 
within 30, like, like 90% of students live, live within a 30 minute drive of a private school, which seems kind of far to me where I have like 30 private schools within probably 15 minutes of me, mm -hmm. but in a lot of rural areas are driving that far to go to school anyway. So there are a lot more options than you realize. There's a lot of Catholic schools and private schools throughout Missouri that if students want to change, they could, or to go to a neighboring district. I mean, we tried to pass an, um, an open enrollment bill this year that was really focused on helping some of the rural. I mean, some, some kids drive really far to go to a school that's, uh, there's another school closer to them because of the proximity of where they live. Mm -hmm. And that does happen. Um, I mean, I don't think that's the rule. And where they have open enrollment, like in Texas, they have open enrollment. Most people choose to go to their local school, but for, for those that it doesn't make sense for that they want to go somewhere else, they can. And the, the highest percentage of, um, Students that we see that take advantage of these choice programs in a state like Florida, it's like 15%. So still the majority of people, kids do end up sticking with whatever the traditional school was. They aren't drained. They aren't closing in places where they have robust, robust choice programs. They aren't closing. Now you do see like in St. Louis area, they're talking about, um, they don't want any more charters because too many schools are closing. Well, they have a declining population, right. but I'll tell you what, if they start closing charters, that population is going to get cut in half because people won't have an, an option that they like for their kids. They're going to move to the counties where they've got better schools. If people in, in the urban areas had more control over when, where they went to school, they would be less likely to flee to the counties where they had better schools. And you'd have a more robust urban area, which has, I think something that we all want is to have you know, I mean, Kansas City is doing better than St. Louis. St. Louis, the city of St. Louis is in downtown is just falling apart and people are leaving. They've less than, I think it's less than 300,000 people in the, the city of St. Louis now. So of course the schools are closing, um, but they're going to have an a, even bigger population decline if they don't get control of the schools and don't do a better job of educating kids. So you, the, the website, uh, for your organization, it refers to school choice as a fundamental right mm -hmm. of parents. Um, we recently saw the that phrase fundamental right uh, utilized in a Supreme Court leak of the Dobbs case. And mm -hmm. from what I can see, it appears about six justices, five justices are about to tell us that fundamental rights aren't what we think they are. Um, and I don't see a fundamental right to school choice in the Constitution. So the same legal status given for, you know, the privacy for abortion that was just overruled is what you, your organization seems to rely on here. Well, that's an interesting analogy. I mean, there are many who believe that, um, especially on your side of the aisle, that healthcare is a fundamental right. And that's not in the constitution. No, it's not. Uh, so well, I, 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 by the way, I think the, that the Dobbs case is batshit crazy. Um, but that's, that's a whole other thing. But I just find it interesting that that's the phrasing is a fundamental right to school choice. Mm -hmm. I think that like, if you look at, you know, who is a child's first teacher to parents, right? Like you teach your kids to walk, to eat. Mine was Elmo, but yeah. Go, go to the bathroom, whatever. <laughs> like you, you, you teach your kid and you're still their greatest teacher. Sure, They're learning no. more from you, whether you've got a book in front of them or not. No, just, I see my seven-year-old do stuff that I go, oh my God, he saw me do that. Yeah. Like, yeah. I know he saw me do that. Well, wait till they start saying words that you weren't supposed to say in front of yeah, them. Yeah, that's too late. <laughs> <laughs> that's too late. That's too late. But why, why, why do you think, you know, you're working for this, this, this nonprofit. Why do you think private schools deserve public money? I mean, the Missouri Constitution, you know, Section 1 uh, or Article 1, Section 7 specifically says no money shall be taken from the public treasury in aid of a church, sect, denomination, or religion. And I don't know a private school, a private religious school that doesn't include religious worship, uh, religious indoctrination as part of its day. Yeah, there are only a few non, uh, you know, completely independent. I think John Burroughs has no, like in St. Louis does not have any kind of religious leaning. There and are then, like the non St. Louis folks, you know, may not understand the like gaggle and tradition of Jesuit schools around the St. Louis area. I mean, yeah. you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a Catholic school in St. Louis. Yeah. Um, it's, um, yeah, there's, it, it, we, we have a robust Catholic, you know, and, and they, not every kid that's in a Catholic school is Catholic. That, right. That's for sure. Um, Especially the basketball players, and the football players. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, 
So I think the fundamental right is of the parents to decide what is the best education. And again, I think part of it is the way we look at tax dollars. So like when you say treasury, I think my tax dollars, I don't mm-hmm. think of it as the government's money. I think of it- So as you don't believe money. in the social contract? Well, I wouldn't say that, but I do think that when you talk about education in particular, you should have choices. There's nothing else we do. Same thing with medical care. They don't tell me what doctor I can go to, even if I am on Medicaid, right? And that is up to the doctor to say whether they want to accept me or not. They just have to be qualified in terms of, you know, licensure, just like the schools have to pass a, some sort of minimum standard of education. And whether there's a religious indoctrination or not, that should be up to the parents. But why should my why should my tax dollars go to fund religious organizations? Why should my tax dollars go to failing schools that aren't teaching kids how to read and write? Because that's not that isn't a First Amendment violation. <laughs> that I mean, plain and simple, the First Amendment is very clear about uh, you know as far as laws favoring religion and the Missouri Constitution mirrors that uh, for that reason. So let me ask it this way. Would you be, would you support it the same if, uh, if the, you know, if the money went to, uh, let's say Al Salam day school in St. Louis is a Muslim based private school. You got no problem with that. No, there's two Muslim schools in my former house district. And one of the things that we were very clear with, cause I'm part of, I've been helping set up the ESA program, um, with the scholarship providers is that they, every school, private school is part of their network right? You can't discriminate based on um, religion or non-sectarianism or whatever. If you're going to give out these scholarships, it's for everybody. And um, I, you know, I live in a place where down the road from me are some apartments that have tons of refugees in the mosque that serves as a mosque and a school, Mm -hmm. also serves as a community center, much like we've seen Catholic Sure, um, very similar. Very similar and has an outreach and helps poor families and is an important part of the community. So I certainly welcome the opportunity to help students in Missouri who would like to attend that school. Um, their, their parents' tax dollars would follow them as well. I think that would be wonderful. And if you're not, the only thing is, the thing that we have to be careful of is um, discrimination, but that's federally protected. You can't discriminate based on race, religion, whatever that follows all those things follow the laws, right? So. What about the, the IDEA Act? Um, back to that, that federal issue of the disability thing, because that doesn't apply to private schools. But if we start giving these private schools this public money, I mean, that's, that to me is a, is a real complication there. What do you mean? Well, There's lots pri- of private schools that take kids with disabilities. But they don't have to. Right. So that's what I'm talking about. So if I have, I have, right, this is not abstract for me. Mm-hmm. I have a child who has a disability. And if I say, I want to use my tax dollars to go to a private school. And if all the private schools around me say, we don't accept children with disabilities, what am I supposed to do? Well, I, I don't think you would find that, but I think as a parent, what you're trying to find is the best fit for your students. So would you want to go to a school that served her needs well? Because I mean, we have a number of private schools that are popping up all over that serve specific special needs. Right, we should just put them all together and that way it'll be separate but equal. I didn't say that. Those are your words. That's what it sounds like. What I'm saying is, so I was contacted by a school that was has popped up in St. Louis County that serves kids with um, mostly, I think it's I think it's mostly autism spectrum. And it's very expensive because they need a lot of staff per student. And they see this as a godsend because it's going to help parents who are struggling to keep their kids in a school that's finally fitting for their student to help them stay there. Is there going to be an answer for every single kid, a private school answer that is convenient? Probably not, but the market will dictate that where there is a demand and we still have a public option, right? Because it is required and there will always be an opportunity to, like like I said, in places where they have a robust choice, we still have the majority of the population goes to public schools. And that option is not going to go away. No one is suggesting that, at least not me and not anybody in my organization. I shouldn't say no one because I do know people who would like to, I was see... going to say there's some folks who retweet some stuff that you put out there that definitely are suggesting that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I got I to gotta step back that. So that's not me. 
Um, I think public schools, good public schools are essential. I think, like I said, I think education is the enemy of poverty. Um, but I think they got to do a better job. And I don't have all the answers when it comes to education, but I do believe that competition leads to innovation. And I do think we have seen places, the, the proof is there. And we have so many kids who have, um, we have a fellows program. So kids who've gone through an experienced school choice can come and learn more about the movement and how to be advocates for things, for things that they believe in, including school choice. And when you sit and you listen to their stories about where they were going and how uh, a voucher or a charter school provided an opportunity for them that they didn't have and to turn their life around, I don't know how you cannot be in favor of that. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, and, you know, for parents who you've got a kid who, for whatever reason, is not thriving with the school they're in to have another opportunity, whether it's through a charter school or a private school, or even if we had open enrollment and they could just go to the school, a district over that maybe was a better fit for whatever reason. Why not? Why not put our kids in the best opportunity for them to thrive, regardless of their parents' financial means? This should be available to everyone, no matter how much money they have. So a little bit of a shift. Um, how much of the model legislation and information that you all push forward at, at AFC comes from the American Legislative Exchange Council? Uh, I don't think, not that I know of. We have our own in-house people that work mm -hmm. on stuff like that. I know we work a lot with... Because um, I mean, you all are a sub of Alliance for School Choice, right? We're what? a sub from Alliance for School Choice. No, American Federation for Children is its own entity. Well, I understand it's its own 5014, but it's an arm of uh, of the underlying a uh, Alliance for School Choice. I don't think so. That doesn't sound right to me. We, we're not, we have our own board. We do our own thing. Sure, like as any 501c4 would have, but, you know, corporations can be spun off of other corporations. So I don't know that corporation. So, and granted, I've only been here a little less than a year, but none of that sounds right to me. So I'm going to push back and be like, I'm not familiar with that. Did you find that somewhere? Yeah, it's worth it's worth checking out. Um, it's not hard to, I mean, these are all, you know, the kinds of things that there's plenty of information out there on. So there's a bajillion places to find nonprofit, you know, watchdog groups. And I'm a big fan of read everything right, and see if there's common threads because- you know, you can find you can find whatever answer you want is out there. But if you can find it in more than one place, you know, and you can find some commonality, then you might be able to, okay, maybe there's something here. That's one that seems to pop up as I, as I, you know, look around, uh, you encourage me, you know, you, you tweeted, I should do some research. I did plenty of right. research. Uh -huh. um, and uh, that's, that's something that popped up. I, I, I didn't find near the number of studies uh, other than the ones on your all's website, but I certainly found that the connection to Alec, the connection to, uh, uh, to Alliance for School Choice, the connection to the DeVos family uh, or DeVos family. Yeah, um, there's definitely connections there. She was one of our original board members. Betsy DeVos was. Um, and then- right, so um, if we want to talk about abolishing public schools, I mean- Then there's um, Education Next. Um, you know, there's um, uh, Excellence in Education. The thing that's a little bit different about us is that we actually um, engage more electorally. We do lobbying and we work in elections. So we try to help elect um, school choice supporters. Mm -hmm. And a, um, a lot of uh, nonprofits and C3s, C4s don't engage politically and we do. So mm -hmm. that's one of the ways that we differ from some of these other kind of think tanky you know, Walton does some stuff, Kaufman does some stuff in St. Louis, I mean, in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, City Fund is very engaged in urban education. Um, that's definitely a left-leaning group, and they um, support us extensively. And I definitely don't discount that, you know, it, I, and I do think that that comes from a different place where you're talking about, if we're talking about urban schooling, you're often talking about historically redlined areas, that where mm -hmm. the property values were, and, you know, systemic racism is real. Um, it may not be the reason for everything the bad that's ever happened to any anybody ever, but it certainly is real. And redlining was real and suppressing property values was real. 
and the system is paid for by property taxes. So if you live in a neighborhood where the people drawing the lines drew the lines to make your property values lower, you're going to have lower funding for your schools. And, you know, so I can understand a desire there, but wouldn't it make more sense to just fix that problem? How if we just fix that? the funding problem? They haven't fixed it. I mean, in places where they're spending, you know, twice as much money as ever, they still haven't fixed it. How, you, how do you fix it? What's your answer? Well, I think it takes time, first of all, but but and that that's the real question because we've got half the folks in, in the Republican Party want to get rid of all property taxes completely, but they don't want to come up with a replacement for that funding. So we've got to have something to fund the schools. Mm-hmm. And you know, if we if, if we can make it a more equal funding across the board rather than basing it on that local funding mechanism, I think that would be fair. I think it would be very fair. So we have a uh, our our director or like PR guy is named Walter Blanks, um, and his mother went to the schools and said, you know, my son's failing. He need he needs something. I, th- I think he was in seventh or eighth grade. And they said, you know, we've got like a five-year plan and we're turning this thing around. And she said, I don't have five years. Sure. And I think that's how a lot of parents feel is they don't have the time to wait for folks to fix schools that they've been waiting for them to fix for for 10, 20, 30 years, whatever. They want answers now for their own kids and we want to support them. And I hate to interrupt this podcast, but the blues just tied it up. (laughs) <laughs> a minute to go. Well, and I was going to say, we're, we're kind of at that point anyway. Um, and I, I super appreciate your time. Uh, not, not to cut, cut it off. I, I think we could probably do this. Well, we did do this for a very long time. Yeah, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't record a lot of it. So, um, yeah. you know, I appreciate your time. I definitely, you know, I, I would love to keep engaging on this because I just straight up disagree with you. And I know you disagree right. with me. Um, and I, I think it's a, it's at least a conversation to have because I don't think there's enough folks on either side of this conversation who are engaging this way. I think there's a lot of folks engaging who agree with one another, but right. not who disagree with one another. Yeah. And that's important. So I appreciate your time, Jean. I can really I give do. you a, can I give another plug for an, a, a, a spinoff of our organization, which is called Black Minds Matter and it's run by Denisha Merriweather. And if you follow her, she is a big supporter, um, of black owned charter schools and letting um, folks who live in these areas where they have failing schools design their own schools and support them. And she's doing amazing work. So if you can check her out, I will try to, I'll try to send you a little tweet. Um, so I just, fo- just followed Black Minds Matter on Twitter. So I'll, I'll okay, check great. it out because I'm, yeah, like I said, I'm an information gatherer. So that's awesome. So thank you so much. This has been great. Yep. Thanks, Jean. All right. Take care. The Heartland Pod is a production of Midmap Media, LLC. Follow us on Twitter with at the Heartland Pod. With email, you can reach us, heartlandpod2020 at gmail.com, online with heartlandpod.com, subscribe, and please sign up for our Patreon with patreon.com slash heartlandpod. Become a podhead or an official podgressive today and unlock all of our content. See you at the next show.